Okay, so about to go live. Okay, so we are live. Good evening, gentlemen. I want to thank everyone that's been able to join. Uh, perhaps, as you mentioned, for uh, those who are here, I want to thank Abiodun Maichu for joining us from Ibadan. Adetola Augustine from joining us from Ibadan. Mark Francis from joining us from Bauchi, I believe. Musokwe, Musokwe Awolo for joining us from Lagos. Thank you, Musokwe, for uh, joining us just on time when I was beginning to share this. All right, uh, today I want to share something on the Christian gospel. Uh, if anybody, if you know what I do, uh, both on my uh, live ministry, the ministry I carry out in the University of Ibadan, what I do on Facebook, my, and uh, things I share with people generally, you know I'm concerned about the heart of the Christian gospel. I want to share the Christian message with God's people, okay? So that's what I do. And uh, sometimes last year, something very interesting happened. I'll try to make it brief because I have quite a lot to share today. Okay, I'll be using about 40 minutes to make this introduction before I open for discussions and questions. Okay, so sometimes last year when the coronavirus was at its height, nobody knew who was going to live and nobody knew who was going to die. You know, even up to this time, nobody knows who is going to still live and who is going to die. You know, so I, I wrote something since I don't have much uh, as, a, as a Nigerian, I don't have much, but I have, uh, such as I have, I thought I should share with God's people. So I wrote a book or a booklet and um, I titled it The Gospel. And there I shared the story of my life. I shared um, everything that I knew about the gospel, all that I have thought about the gospel, you know, why I do what I do, why sometimes I can be very earnest about my uh, ministry on Facebook, you know. So I shared that in the book and um, uh, I wouldn't say it was very, it was widely accepted, you know, theology is not something that is very popular in this, in this climb. Uh, but uh, I, I published that, and uh, today we have uh, that book outside. So today, uh, in that book, there were six chapters. So in this series of classes, which I have actually designed for young people, for students, and uh, probably other people who are open to hearing the gospel, you know, in this series of classes, I've actually designed um, one class for each chapter, or each chapter, one class to cover each chapter of that book. You know, and I'm just going to look at the heart of the gospel. So today I want to examine something I call the matter of true conversion, uh, the matter of true conversion. Okay. Um, if you are well, if you have if you have the book, unfortunately I didn't. I've not put the link to the book anywhere. Probably when I publish the uh, this video finally on uh, YouTube, I'll put the link over there. Okay. But if you have the the book, at least if you are just joining, I'll just try to mute your uh, video and sound. And then eventually we'll still ask for people to speak uh, when I'm done with my presentation. Okay, so uh, we, we, I have something like a syllabus here and I want to share that. So in the first, today I want to look at this matter of true conversion, okay? And next week by God's grace, I'm looking at probably two classes to cover a brief, a brief history of Christianity. Uh, use two classes, that's two Sundays to cover a brief history of Christianity. Okay, and then on the third, third following those two Sundays, we're going to look at justification by faith, sin and justification specifically. Following that, we'll look at the matter of eternal security, okay, and then the important matter of holiness and sanctification, or sanctification as I titled it, and then I'll try to round up on a final note, okay? So that is what I have to deal with in this um, discussion. But before we do that, uh, perhaps I should ask this very silent question. What were uh, the reformers, not the reformers, the Westminster, the smaller Westminster Confession document will say that what is the essence of life? Okay, what's the essence of our living? Uh, the essence of our living is to, is to love God and to, glorify, and to glorify him, something like that. I can't remember it specifically. But you see, all of that came about because of one thing. All of the, I mean, all of this matter of, you know, loving God, serving him, glorifying God as born again Christians, they all came about because of one thing. Something happened in history, okay? And um, probably as we begin to go deeper into this class, you're going to realize that there's a close connection between theology and history, okay? So something happened in history, our world, in history. Uh, the son of God, 
was born. That is God took on flesh and he came into this world. It is as recorded in the Holy Writ in the revelation of the Bible. That's on one hand, but you see, historically also, we have so many documents that proves and shows that Jesus Christ actually was born. Our Lord lived, our Lord died. Okay, very few people know whether he was, I mean, he was raised from the dead and God basically reserved the issue of the resurrection of Christ for believers alone. But historically, Christ was born, Christ lived and Christ uh, died, he died on the Roman cross. Okay, so I want to share with us the heart of the Christian gospel as it is found from Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse 21. Some of us may know it already. It's the story of how an angel appeared to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the man, the, man, the angel said this to her. Oh, no, no, he said this to Joseph in a dream. Said this to him, he said, verse 21, she, that is Mary, will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. Jesus Christ coming into this world to save men from sin and sinfulness is the whole essence of living, okay? So in one hand, believers live to proclaim the message of Christ coming to save men from sin, okay? And then all believers, we, I mean, are living with the hope that someday they may find this message. They don't have that hope. We believers are the ones that have that hope. And God, by God, I mean, by God in mercy also shows that hope towards them. Okay, so that's the essence of living. That someday we may find the reason why Christ Jesus Christ died. I mean, Jesus Christ died. Jesus Christ died to save us from our sins. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Another scripture that helps us to see the gospel in a nutshell is actually 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, perhaps I should get a little feedback. Is my voice clear? Can I get a okay, little you. You, you can hear me? All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, I'm not going to get it on. You can? Another scripture that helps us to comprehend the gospel very well is this scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. It reads, and I quote. Sorry, it's not chapter 12. <laughs> it's chapter 15. No, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Sorry. Verse 1 to 4. It reads, and I quote. Now, I will remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you also received, in which you stand, and by which you are also being saved. If you hold fast to the word that I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. So this is Paul talking to the Corinthians and saying that, look, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preach to you. And he's actually warning them here and he's saying that it is possible that you have also even believed this gospel in vain. We're going to get to this matter of believing in vain or the issue of uh, uh, no conversion, okay, which is believing in vain. But in verse 3, three on, and I quote, for I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance to scriptures, and that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance to scriptures. Okay, so exactly what was in Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 is what Paul is reiterating here. He says, Christ Jesus died. Christ Jesus died for the sins of men. And what confirms it? The scriptures. Scripture lays credence to the fact of Christ's death and resurrection, okay? Unfortunately, we are living in an age when people despise the scripture. People don't believe the Bible as the word of God. But in the days of Paul, people, I mean, Paul regarded scripture as the revelation that proves the fact that Christ Jesus lived and died. And I hope you appreciate that because you see, Paul was not living 200 or 300 years after Christ. He was living only a few years after Christ. So he was not referring to, 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 to prove the veracity of Christ's death and resurrection. He was not, he wasn't pointing to something that happened a few years back. He pointed to what? He pointed to scriptures. So if some of you are here and thinking, why is the Jesuitical reading from the Bible? It is because we Christians see the scriptures as the word of God. 
and the word of God is true. The word of God is something that is worth basing our lives on. Okay, experience is fine. Paul had the experience. Uh, Paul, Paul lived in the days of Paul, of Jesus, but he didn't say uh, it, this thing happened because we witnessed it some two, three years ago, or four, ten years ago. No, he said it was big because Scripture said it. We believe it. Scripture says it. We believe it. Okay. So today I have some in presentation to you. And um, I, let, let me tell you why I want to make this presentation. Uh, this is a reformed um, congregation, sorry, a reformed preaching. Uh, and I know that many of you who are witnessing this, at least in the class here, are familiar with reformed theology. People who are looking at it from Facebook may not be familiar with reformed theology. But this reformed preaching, and in reformed theology, we have a high regard for scriptures or for the Bible. We, we see, we have a high, uh, yeah, high regard for the Bible. If scripture says so, we, we receive it. Okay, just like Paul is saying here, we base everything that we've experienced or we see on scripture. Okay, however, I'm going to be doing something that's a little bit, uh, uh, for, 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 the, for the sake of this class, I'll be doing something that's a little bit different from reformed tradition. Okay, I want to share the story of my conversion today in uh, this live class, and uh, I hope it blesses you. Okay, um, if you have been, if you have watched any of our interview before uh, on uh, Reform Ninja Television, or you have um, uh, probably uh, seen me interview people before, or probably listened to questions like Chris Hansen, who is a role model for me in broadcast, uh, Reform broadcast. Okay, you will realize that many times before the interview starts, we want to know who is this person talking about. I mean, who is this person talking? What's his experience? What's his conversion experience? So today I want to talk about how I became a Christian. And at the same time, I want to talk about how I um, how I encountered Reformed theology. Through it, I want to narrow down to this matter of genuine conversion. Okay, the matter of the Christian testimony is very solid. In the Bible, the whole Bible is, is story. Okay, and God in mercy permits that the story in scripture, the story of godly people and the story of his people on earth be a testimony to the world of what he is doing. Okay, so today I want to share um, um, the story of my conversion and I'm going to use a PowerPoint. Uh, you'll be able to read it as I'm reading. So please bear with me. It's going to be a little lengthy. So I just want to plead with you that you endure the time. But I trust God that I wouldn't exceed the stipulated time that we have planned for this uh, discussion. Okay, so let me just give me a few minutes to share my screen. Um, where am I? So I think I'm here. Give me one minute. Okay, so I think I'm about to start. All right, so that's the story of my conversion. Uh -huh. By the way, this story, I got this story from, uh, sorry, from the book. You know, I was just supplying a link to the book. Some of you may have it already. Okay, so uh, it's just basically, I'm just reading the chapter one of the book. I read it yesterday. I thought instead of saying my story from off head, why don't I just read what I wrote in the book? So please bear with me. All right. Ever since I became a Christian in the year 1998, I've been a member of four church denominations. From 1998 till my graduation in 2002 from the University of Amadou Bello University, uh, Zaria, I was a member of the Christian Teaching Center, CTC, Zaria. I don't know state, that's my first church, okay? The church was opposite the Amadou Bello University main campus. For a brief period following graduation, I was a member of the Lateran Assembly between the year 2004 and 2005 during my search for greener pastures in Lagos. It was at latter end that I became baptized in water as an adult. My mother had baptized all of us infants as Roman Catholics when we were born. In, in December 2005, when I came to Ibadan, I joined the Vine Branch Church, Mokola Ibadan. I remained in this church until I left in 2014. That would make my third church. From March, uh, 2014 till date, my family have, and I have been members of the Chapel of the Resurrection University of Ibadan, okay, in Oyo State, making my port my present church. In two of those denominations, I ended my relationship with them with letters. 
at City Caesarea, I wrote my pastor a letter which I titled On Doctrine and Practices, a critical evaluation of a local church doctrine and practice. The long and short of that letter was that the gospel message was increasingly lacking in the mass sermons and practices that were animating from this church. I gave a copy of the letter to my pastor of that time, another copy to the general overseer of the CTC group of churches, who was actually a medical doctor turned the pastor. I doubt that these two men ever read those notes because I did not hear from them. Uh, the letter was also a patent note of sort because I was living in Zaria for the National Youth Service in Yola, uh, Adama State. A friend of mine, Dr. Paul Adoyi, had asked me to put my thoughts in writing, at least for the records. I did, and since then, I had not returned to CTC. Okay, on the 28th of December, 2012, I went to the administrative block of Vine Branch Church in Badu and delivered a letter to the pastors, which I titled, Letter to My Pastors. I remember the date well because it was the morning my daughter, our firstborn, turned one year old. I gave copies of the letter to the senior pastor and two of his associates. All to the time I'm writing this note, and even up till now, I had not received an official response from the leadership of that church. The senior pastor, however, sent me a text message in which he counseled me not to allow anger to ruin my life. I did not respond to the text message because I considered it an insult. If he could not make a formal response to me, he should at least have called me for a dialogue. That's what I felt. In that letter, I was again calling the leadership of the church to the silent matter of the gospel. How unimportant matters were crowding out the gospel message from church life. After submitting the letter to Vine Branch, I found, I found that the reaction to it was becoming unbearable for my family and myself. And two years later, we left Vine Branch for the Chapel of the Resurrection University of Ibadan. In March 2014, I met the chaplain of the Chapel of Resurrection. Rather than wait till the end of my stay at the chapel, okay, I decided to submit a document to him about the, uh, about the first few months we were there. Okay, I tried to that document my concern for all the churches. The chaplain claimed to have read the document, that's a former chaplain, not the present one, but I never got any written response from him. Again, the core of that document was that the gospel was being lost in the churches and there was a need to reclaim it. I write all this to give context to the series of lectures I am delivering at the moment. I tell these stories so as to help uh, you, my readers or viewers, I appreciate how I came to grasp the gospel message and why I have a passion for proclaiming it in the manner that I do. I believe that the matter of the gospel is at the heart of my actions. What then is the problem exactly? When I look back at my conversion, I realized that I underwent two conversion experiences. That's why we're discussing this matter of genuine conversion, two conversion experiences. The first one I believe was an awakening. The other was about how I came to know God after I had encountered the gospel. Unfortunately, I have come to realize also that many people profess, or that what many people profess as conversion experiences in the churches today are just mere awakening. They appear never to have moved into the conversion proper because the gospel element is missing in their conversion story. Let me explain further by recounting how I met Jesus. Okay, so I want to talk to you first about my first encounter with the Lord, my awakening. It was sometimes in the late February 1998, I was staying with two of my friends at the spot block of Suleiman Hall, ABU uh, Zari, I think they call it F15 uh, or something like that, can't remember specifically. My friend had a born again roommate. So all four of us were living together. But my friend and I, and I that is three of us, we hated this SU guy, who was also a photographer because he spent all his time at fellowship meetings. One day I returned early from church, or sorry, from lectures, and thought that I should have lunch, I mean, I should make lunch for the boys. They would, they would soon return, and we had this practice that whoever got to the room first should cook for everyone. But we never mixed with the SU guy. That's, uh, his name is Gabriel Olga, and our things were separate from his. Gabriel was the first person to come into the room that day. For some reason beyond me, I asked Gabriel if you would like to have a plate of rice and beans. I normally would not offer anything, but God had his own plans. Okay, so Gabriel accepted my food, and after eating, he said, 
I always thought you were different. I responded, what do you mean? He explained that no one ever gave him food in that room before this year. And because he had to combine lectures and his photography business, he spent quite a lot of money buying food from the cafeteria. The meal I had offered him would save him some money at least for that afternoon. Then just like Isaac blessed Jacob after eating the food, Gabriel Olga began to share the salvation message with me. He told me I needed to know Jesus as I had long been rebelling against the Lord. Then he led me to say a sinner's prayer. All that was going on in my mind as he was saying all of this was to quickly get out of that room because the whole environment was becoming intense. I could actually feel it. It was obvious a strange presence was with us in the room. This encounter took about an hour. None of, in fact, it still remains a surprise to me till the date that the way students barging into each other, you know, throughout that time, no, nobody came into the, into, the, into the room until we're done. As Gabriel paid, prayed for me, he gave what Pentecostal called a word of knowledge. With no prior knowledge of the state of my academic records in the Department of Electrical Engineering, okay, Gabriel said, things are not good for you in the department, but if you return to God, God will restore your result or something to that effect. I was in my first uh, semester 300 level and I was languishing in a sorry third class, some kind of 2.20 then, if I can still remember. There was no way things could get better for me at that rate, 300 level. But I would eventually graduate with a solid second class lower today. Today, I no longer believe in Pentecostal phenomena like words of knowledge and so on or prophecies. But I hold that for the sake of converting sinners, God can still work a miracle today to bring his elect to him. Yet, miracles are not the gospel. And this is the point I hope to make subsequently. At the end of the prayer with Gabriel Oga, I was in tears. I had once known the Lord, but I had backslid him. And this was homecoming for me. I returned to my class that day, at that afternoon, a new man. I was born again. My university classmates used to call me DJX, um, but they learned later that the famous rapper had turned uh, to Christ. The issue of my rapping uh, is another story entirely. It was all jolly and well, and I remain thankful for that experience, but I'm certain that as good as that story might have sounded, that experience was not my conversion, okay? So uh, it's important also to note here that while I did experience a miracle in my result, God also mercifully showed me practical means to excel. First, because I had become a Christian, I parted company with my old friends and started to spend more time with believers in church. Two brothers, and I want to mention their names here, Taiwan Kende Bawanda, were instrumental to teaching me how to study. They were the ones who taught me that the secret to passing exams in the university was reading past questions. I didn't know that prior to that, even up to 300 level. That was how things changed for me. From my second semester 300 level till I graduated, my GP did not fall below 3.5. Okay, eventually scaling my result up from third class to second class uh, lower. The real miracle was that most you know, no, sorry, the real miracle is that most people's uh, university result always declines. Mine didn't decline, it only got better uh, after my conversion. So here's the story of my conversion. After my conversion in quote, Gabriel Olga took me to CTC, Christian Teaching Center, opposite our school. I became quite committed to the church, but almost immediately I began to see lapses in the church. Because I was young, I could not voice my opinion. I spent a lot of time praying about these things and reading scriptures. I also devoured a lot of Christian literatures, although for some reason, I never found the prosperity uh, faith genre of reading appealing. I mostly read books that thought about the born again life and how to grow as a new Christian. It was in the process of reading that I encountered Alti Kendall's book titled Worshiping God. That book taught me what it means to be a Christian and how to worship God with my lifestyle. I still practice many of the tips this great man of God taught me. For example, my prayer life is still based on what that man taught me. My reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is still based on what that man taught me in that book. In one of the chapters, chapters titled The Joy of Doing Nothing, I encountered the concept of justification by faith for the first time in my life. It was Kendall that also introduced me to Reformed theology, the writings of Martin Luther and John Calvin, and the whole swath of Protestant Christianity dating back to the 16th century. Reading this concept of Christianity led me to study the Bible, the Bible book of Romans in depth. I believe that it was while reading Romans chapter four and coming to understand, the, the, uh, coming to understand justification by faith alone without works, resting in Christ 
all, I mean, totally, was uh, how God forgives sinners and so on. That, that was how I encountered the gospel. This happened in the latter part of 1998. I was still a member of CTC. I was still speaking in tongues and so on. But God had changed my heart and given me a new message and a new passion for life. It was this message that I saw lacking in the preaching at CTC that led me to write those letters to the pastor. Unfortunately, from CTC to Lateran to Vine Branch and even to the Chapel of the Resurrection, where I now worship, it is either this gospel message is not taught at all or it is only glossed over. In fact, for the first time in my almost nine years in Chapel of the Resurrection, the pastor who preached today in church mentioned Martin Luther, quoted Martin Luther for the first time. For the first time. Okay, I've never, nobody has ever quoted John Calvin in Chapel of the Resurrection. Okay, what people pursue usually in our churches today is the initial experience I've had, that initial awakening, which I'm starting with just an awakening. People are awakened to righteousness through Pentecostal experiences, but they never follow on to know the Lord via the gospel of grace. It is the gospel that changes heart and makes sinners saints. It does not matter the experience you have had. If you have not understood the gospel and thus repented of your sin, you are not a Christian. Many people encounter God through miracles and wonderful experiences, but they do not hear the gospel, and thus they are not saved. They simply continue in churches as awakened sinners and not converted people. I've had issues with many pastors who claim to have had wonderful experiences of healing and breakthrough and save and several other Pentecostal realities. Only a few of them talk about a gospel that changes the heart. I hope this book will be able to shed light on what the gospel is and also to show what the gospel is not. In the next chapter, I'll be spending some time to look at the historical context of the gospel. Okay, how we got our Bible, how we even got Christianity. Okay, I'll point out a few instances in history, church history, where the gospel has been under attack. And I hope that by reading it, you will better appreciate the core of the gospel message. In subsequent chapters, I will touch on the heart of the gospel and help you to comprehend it with the hope that those who hear it will be saved. Amen. Okay, so that's the, uh, my presentation for you. Uh, let me just pause here. I want to thank Paul Aulabi for joining us. Moshe Fair Aulabi for joining us. Mark Francis, uh, Adetola Augustine, Adeni Adesholam, Adebola Saeed, thank you. And then my co-host, Abiyodun Matthew, thank you for joining us. Okay, so that is the story of my conversion. Incidentally, Adebola Saeed was with me in um, ABU in those days, and he can tell, me, tell you a little bit about my rap days, okay? But, um, so that's it. Now, why am I regaling you guys with this story of my life? I'm going somewhere, and I just want you to please bear with me. Why am I regaling you with this story of my life? It is this. See, we all have to check ourselves. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 15, where he said that it is possible to have had the gospel in vain. It's possible. It's possible that, you know, uh, in the process of um, identifying with gospel life or churches, what happened to you was not a real conversion. And things are going to happen in people's life to show that, I mean, their encounter, their so-called encounter with the Lord was not a real encounter. I personally believe that if I had not followed on, if God in mercy had not opened scriptures to me and helped me to understand the gospel of Christ, especially the concept of being justified by faith without works, I would have gone back into the world a long time ago. That Pentecostal experience, that word of knowledge, and that it was not enough. In fact, it was later on, I came to find out that a lot of people got awakened that way. Okay, many people that I know today who are Christians, they got awakened into Christianity by some Pentecostal experience, by some healing. You understand? By something that got miraculously around them. Okay? But God had to still reveal scripture to them to bring them to eternal life. So why am I shaking? Why am I sweating? Why am I doing this? Why am I, why did I tell this story? Why am I talking about this matter of genuine compassion? It still boils down to this tragedy that we have in our day today called Rabbi Zacharias. Okay, so I have a brother who I have been contending with and he's saying that Rabbi just nearly fell. He just 
fell like anybody could have fallen. Okay. But I am still of the opinion that at the point of Rabbi Zachariah's conversion, he was never genuinely converted. Rabbi Zachariah had some kind of experience with Christ. He had some kind of, uh, how I call it, uh, encounter with the Lord. But he did, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't follow on to know the Lord. There's a scripture that I was supposed to look for and read here, but I don't have it readily. I'll just try to quote it. It's in Second Peter, I believe, um, Second Peter chapter one, I believe. The Bible talks about being born again by the word of God. Being born again by the word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not born again by word of knowledge. We're not born again by miracles. We're not born again by speaking in tongues, falling down. We're born again by what? By the word of God. What is this word of God? Scriptures. But then you now say, ah, so what the people who are illiterate and cannot read scriptures, how, how do they get converted? By hearing the preached word. Okay? So it is always one way or the other. Well, it's always the word of God. Either as you have read it and studied it and understood it, or somebody preached it to you, but you heard. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, it says that how would we hear, thank you, First Peter chapter 1, verse 23, God bless you. How will, how will we hear except we, I mean, how would they hear except there's a preacher? And how would, how would they be said except, I mean, uh, I mean, um, uh, sorry, salvation comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, okay? So either by reading scripture, understanding and you're converted, or by hearing the preached word, it is the word of God that converts sinners. It is the word of God that converts sinners. And that's the crux of the matter here, okay? That the, 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 the challenge with church life, any regular church, or the challenge with our churches today is that we have too many people who are church members who are not converted, or we have too many ministers who are not converted. Okay? So you ask, in fact, you ask some people, how did you become born again? And then they become offended. I want to mute somebody's. Uh, 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 Matthew, please, if you have access, I want you to mute. Okay, okay, everybody's. Thank you. Uh, let me speak over. So we, we have a, a, a church churches today, I mean, full of unconverted, I mean, look. This whole matter of uh, Suleiman, Johnson Suleiman or Johnson Suleiman, his problem is that the man is not a Christian. Okay, I have a friend in Ilori who gets upset with me when I begin to say that pastors are not Christian. I say, what do you mean they are not Christian? They are not Christian. They are not converted. They have not encountered the word that will change their hearts. Oh, are you now saying that, ex I mean, uh, uh, Christians cannot commit sin? Are you saying that Christians cannot commit the kind of sins that uh, Rabbi Zachariah committed? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that even when Christians commit such sins, we see fruit of repentance, fruits that are in keeping with repentance. Okay? And I keep referring to this man, uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Art Azodia, who some two, three, four years ago committed terrible sin. He fell. Okay? And he fell. He crashed. And I mean, instead of coming out and denying it, I said, I did it. And he ended his ministry there, resigned from his church, gave up all his, um, what do they call it? All his, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, Matthew, I'm going to have to mute you. You are the one making those noises. Uh, he gave up all the retirement benefits and went into oblivion. Okay? This is a man who used to preach with uh, John MacArthur in, in, in the Shepherd Conference. It gave it everything up. Why? Fruit of genuine repentance. So it is what people do when they have seen that shows whether they are true Christians or not. That's on one hand. And then on the other hand, God is also very faithful. I mean, I have seen it in my life, you know. I mean, you start on a path that could lead to some terrible sin and God cuts it short. God cuts it short. Why? Because if for example, if the Jesus supposed sins, if something happens to him, if I do some kind of terrible thing, it is the name of the Lord and the church of Christ whose hope that will blaspheme. And many times God protects his name and protects his church 
and ensures that before the sin becomes terrible, he nips it in the bud. Okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, and let me end with uh, a terrible um, uh, word for you. Uh, I just want you to bear with me. Before I do that, let me read. Um, I have this scripture, 2 Corinthians. I'm coming one minute, please. Second Corinthians chapter 13, I'm going to read from by five to six. The reason I quote, Paul is speaking to us. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself, or do you not realize this about yourself that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test. So Paul, writing to the Corinthians, whom he had referred to as saints in chapter 1, in the end of the chapter, sorry, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, he says, look, gentlemen, examine yourself. Are you Christians? Are you born again? I'm asking you, are you born again? Okay? In, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, there's a terrible scripture there. Don't know whether you've seen it before. Verse 24 to 25. It reads, and I quote, the sins of some men are conspicuous. It's clear to all. Okay? The sins of some men are clear, going before them to judgment. But the sins of others appear later. So also the good works of others are conspicuous, and even those that are not, <clears throat> cannot remain hidden. Okay? <coughs> So verse 24 is actually my emphasis. The sins of some people is clear. God reveals it. They have opportunity to repent. The sins of some others is behind them. It's not clear. Everybody thought they were Christians. Everybody thought they were wonderful people. Everybody, but they get to heaven. No the boom. Uh, brother, where's your conversion experience? I mean, certificates. How did you meet the Lord? Do you understand the gospel? All right. So this is the introduction to the whole uh, class. Uh, I want to talk, I'm, I'm talking ex ex I mean specifically about uh, those of us who are professing to be Christians, have, have we encountered the Lord? Are we saved? Are we Christians? If we are not, then I want to invite you to come along in this journey. Uh, in the next five or six weekends, I'm going to be looking at the gospel concept. Before I even look at it, for about two Sundays or one Sunday, I'm going to look at how we got, I mean, I mean I'm going to look at church history, everything that happened after Acts chapter 28. Okay, I'm going to try to compress everything to a lecture, and I hope uh, it instructs you. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my discussion. I hope you enjoyed it. I want to put it on now. I'm done. Okay, so uh, if you have a contribution, I want to thank um, somebody. Okay, Adeni Adesola, thank you. Incidentally, I don't, I'm not sure whether I know this person. Thank you for joining me, joined from Facebook. If you have a contribution, question, if not, then we um, end. I think I have a contribution. All right, thank you, Bola. He was my classmate from university. Okay, so um, I, I think my contribution is, you said a lot of things. Some of them I think I agree with, some of them I will say I don't. I'm going to pick on them the way you, you pointed it out. The, the, I know we've had conversations about this genuine conversion at one point or the other. And mm -hmm. while you can know them by the fruits or what they exhibit as humans, because most of the things we have in today's world is that you become a pastor, you get to a place of complacency, and then you feel you can do no wrong. That, even scripturally, is totally wrong. And that's why I'm very, very careful when I say this person is actually genuinely converted and this person is not. There's an element of it where it's only God that knows who is genuinely converted. And that goes into the, the sovereignty of God. 
that has its own aspect to it. There are things, okay, I'll take for, to, for instance, a simple example of my pastor, uh, of the, 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 you know, the church that I attend today, my pastor. Yes. Uh, there was a time he, he kind of uh, quoted, um, uh, where he referenced somebody and then he didn't give proper plagiarism to pay, to make it to cut it uh, to make it really simple okay. and short. And then, okay. because each time we have a sermon, there's a, a body of elders that will review those things and then they point it out to you, uh, or of course to the pastor in that case. That okay. this is wrong. You should have referenced them. And then he came okay. to church the following Sunday, and then he genuinely, you know apologized to the whole congregation, pointed out what was wrong, what he did wrong, and asked for forgiveness. That is a genuine heart. You cannot, and I'm saying this emphatically, you cannot get to a place. I mean, everybody is human. The only person that we know as, you know, recorded in the Bible is Christ. It's without sin. So if you get, you cannot get to a place where you are and then say, you Hello? Hello, Paula. So for me, it's important. Why it's important to be Hello, Paula. We can't hear you. Oh, okay. Um, Did you remove something? Can, can you? Hold on one second. I think there's somebody that is trying. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, okay. I uh, know. I, it's, your voice is very far away. You, I think you are yeah, using something to speak. Somebody that is trying to call in to me, and I'm trying to reject the call, but it's not allowing. Oh, me. Oh, Give me a second. Oh, oh. Where? Uh, no is problem. No to... problem. Okay. No problem. Oh, no. All right. Um, okay. Thank you, Bola. When you are done, yeah. just get back to us. Yeah. Um. Do we have any other contribution? Bola will still join us when he's ready. Any other contribution? I. 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 I um. Why Bola said he disagreed with me, he has not read that, raised anything that he disagreed with me because everything he has said so far, I agree completely. Okay, that, uh, although I've not touched on that, probably I'll still touch on it later, but God indeed alone knows who are, are Christians. But I also think that, um, and then I sometimes still going to preach on, that um, God gives um, all of us Christians uh, an assurance of salvation. Bola, are you ready? Yes, I am. I am. Right. So, right. so I mean, just to wrap it up, because I don't intend to take much of our time, it is important for us to as Christian to evolve in our Christian work with God, meaning that every day we strive <laughs> to, do, to do better. And to do better means there has to be a genuine love for God. Those you love, those you love, you will try as much as you want, as, as possible, by grace, as we have been promised, to do right by them, in this case, God, because we are called to worship. So if for any reason, and this, this is with no exception to anyone that is born of a woman, if for any reason you fall, you must be able to come and say it and not just say it, because it goes in different ways. I mean, in one case, you come before the congregation and you say, this is wrong. And then you let the system, in this case, <coughs> the council of elders, to decide what becomes of you. But at that point, you have accepted you have sinned. And then that sin, you also, I mean, there's a, an aspect of it that you need to confess to God and to the body of Christ. And then when you do that, it shows a general, because who are we kidding? I mean, are we, are we going to fear that, that person that can just kill the body or the one that has both the body and the soul. Because if you can't do that, it's just simple. The Bible makes it clear. So the place where I disagree with you is that, okay. you know, if there's no, there's a, an element where God, do, being a sovereign God, can actually yeah. know who is actually converted. You cannot take that away from God because it's part of the sovereignty <coughs> of who God is. That's just yeah. all I, I have to say. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, but I say you disagree with me. Actually, I think um, there's no disagreement about that. I actually agree with him completely on that. I'm not sure I've gotten to the point of um, how we're converted um, or, or who is converted, who is not, how to be sure you're converted or all of that. I'm still going to touch on it. Uh, today, I just wanted to create that foundation of um, uh, right before we even start doing any good or before we even start repenting at all. I want to be sure of the foundation that we have. 
in the Lord, that that foundation is truly of the Lord. And um, excuse me, I shared two experiences. First, the first experience was actually an encounter, you know, which I uh, believe that a lot of people experience today and which many times leads many of them to becoming professing Christians. But there is no word in it. There is no scriptural post and base for it. Okay, uh, you may just say, okay, I gave you a slide card. They gave you a slide card, why? Uh, did he hear something? What, or what did he hear about the message of the gospel that changed his mind to help him to become a Christian? Okay, so it's possible that a person can experience a healing, uh, can experience even prosperity, whatever, any blessing from God, and still not have encountered the word of God that is able to uh, change his heart. Uh, let, let me read that scripture. Um, um, the person, okay, somebody uh, left a comment. Uh, thank you, Mark Francis. Mark Francis says, it is a wonderful and, uh, sorry, it's been a wonderful and educative session. I'm looking forward to subsequent um, sessions, okay? Um, and then Yadish Shola left, gave me the, uh, the text. So it is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. So let me just read that quickly. It reads, and I quote, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable uh, through the living and abiding word of God. So we are born again by the word of God, the uh, uh, living word of God, not by certain experiences and so on and so forth. Do we have any other comments or questions? <clears throat> um, DG, I was going to ask, do you all... Yes. I mean, those slides that you showed, I was kind of a little bit distracted. So maybe, I mean, I don't know how comfortable you are. I would like to go through it again. Not right now, maybe okay. when the whole thing is over. No problem. So I'll just email that to you. Uh, if you want the slide sent to you, or uh, you can send me an inbox either on Facebook or on this. It's actually a booklet, but I, I can send this slide to you. It's not a problem. Uh, thank you. I'm looking at Facebook to see if I does, uh, I'm not getting too many responses from Facebook. I can't even see whether people are joining us on Facebook. Uh, do we have any, <coughs> any, any contribution? Uh, yeah, one of the things I, I have to keep reminding people that we are not in church. Or we are, it's in church that you keep quiet and listening. Yeah, we're in a gathering and uh, you have liberty to ask questions. Uh, yeah, Does somebody wants to speak. Abiyod. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, yeah, I want to say, uh, I want to say this has been quite uh, revealing. Uh, I agree with uh, almost everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I just think uh, this is just what is happening in most of our churches. You know, I, this might be this might not be needed, but I think. This is just what is happening. If you look at our churches today, you find out that some people think uh, coming to church and doing some things in church for Christian, they take that instantly. Meanwhile, as you have stated in your book, it is just a mere awakening, and uh, they have not yet come to that conversion stage. Uh, my prayer is that uh, this uh, this teaching uh, will bring men to save the of Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you, Pedro. Jada, we didn't hear you very well, uh, but thank you so much for that comment. Okay, um, all right, so I want to believe that uh, we don't have any question or any comment, so I'll just bring the Facebook um, broadcast to an end, and then I, I didn't see any 